traditional economics is based on two assumptions about people. That people are selfish, always trying to do what's best for them, and that people make rational choices that are in their own self-interest. When a person is presented with options under a condition of scarcity, they should choose the option that maximizes their satisfaction. The videos so far on Entirely Economics have all assumed that people are fully informed when making choices and choose the optimal option. While these models do hold up pretty well in the real world, at the level of the individual, they don't always match how a person actually behaves. People are irrational. They don't always make the optimal choice. There are limits to people's rationality and there are limits to how well rationality describes people. We have emotions, we have baggage, and we can be influenced in the choices we make. We are only human after all. Because we don't live in an ideal world of purely rational decision makers, we need something else to help understand the choices people make. And for that, we have behavioral economics. When people first began to study economics in the 18th century, men such as Adam Smith linked economic behavior with psychological explanations. As economics developed, economists sought to frame it as a natural science subject to rules, and the idea of people as rational agents took hold. It wasn't until the last half of the 20th century that economics again began to seriously consider the role psychological, emotional, cultural and social factors played in how people and organizations make choices, and behavioral economics was the result of this. The study not of how economic agents should make choices, but of how they actually do. An integration of psychology and microeconomics, which adds to the understanding classical economic theory gives us. So, how are people not rational? In 1957, Herbert Simon proposed the idea of bounded rationality, that consumers have factors limiting their ability to make the optimal choice. The three main factors doing that are cognitive ability, people just aren't smart enough, time constraints, and limited information. If we don't have all the information we need, if we are in a hurry, or if we don't have enough time to think things through, we cannot make the optimal choice. With these constraints, often we don't look to make the best choice, merely one which is good enough for what we need. We act as satisficers, a term coined by Herbert Simon by blending satisfy and suffice. We look not for the maximum utility, just for an outcome that suffices to meet the minimum we need to achieve. Other forms of irrationality come from the biases we have and the fallacies we believe in. There's present bias, where people are more focused on small benefits now than greater payoffs in the future. People who are not paying into a pension fund, for example. The gambler's fallacy, the idea that something having happened or not happened in the past makes it more likely to happen or not happen in the future. This is the fallacy that keeps people at the gaming table because their card has to come up soon. If it's been heads three times in a row, surely now it must be time for tails. And there's loss aversion. People tend to prefer avoiding losses to acquiring the equivalent gain. The pain of losing $10 is greater than the pleasure of finding $10. Loss aversion leads to people missing out on opportunities. Behavioral economics is one of the most fascinating fields of research in economics today. It's been the topic of recent Nobel Prizes in economics and has given rise to fields such as behavioral game theory. It also plays a role in the development of artificial intelligence. And it impacts you even if you don't realize it. Companies know that you are not the rational decision maker you think you are. And they play on this with the prices they charge, the packaging they use, and the advertising that they aim at you. 